Praise God. Remain standing. Let's read the word together, shall we? And I'll point your attention to the screen. Mark chapter 2 is where I'm going to be reading from. Mark chapter 2, if you will. Okay, I've been told it's not up, so I'll read it. Mark chapter 2, and let's look at verse number 1. And again he entered into Capernaum after some days. And it was noise that he was in the house. Isn't it good when he's in the house? And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that they, there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them, he being Jesus. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, a paralytic, which was born of four, and catch King James Version for being carried by four men. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, boy, the media's always been a problem, hasn't it? <laughs> You'll get that later. I'll quit joking. They uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it, now, don't ever tell me that prayer lines are not biblical. I mean, these guys broke in lines. So they uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had spoke, broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Be seated. May the Lord bless his word today. With everything happening in our world, COVID-19, a pandemic that swept the globe, first time in human history that's ever happened. Inoculations or vaccinations of which are being mandated by a lot of governments in the world, forcing people to uh, do something to their, put something in their body they don't want to put in their body. In our country alone, we see people quitting their jobs, leaving their jobs. I think this month I read in the paper 4.3 million people just this month. Things going on in the economy in America with uh, gas prices skyrocketing, food prices going up. You see it. You know what I'm talking about. All these things that are happening. Not to mention the fact that we feel that well, I shouldn't say we. I'll speak for myself. I feel that we witnessed an election that was very dishonest. We'll say that, right? Uh, so trust in what little trust we may have had in the government is now squashed, right? Uh, all the things that are happening. I think the greatest plague to our nation and the world is the one of mental illness. It's, those are buzzwords today. Uh, the evil that happens in the world, school shootings, rampant. The evil that we see, murder, violence. Many of it, many times, is attributed to mental illness. Uh, doctors are quick to say you have one. If you get anxious or depressed or despondent, well, that's a mental illness. Try this. And I believe that's legitimate a lot of times, that the brain can be sick just like the heart, just like the lungs, and medicine does that person very well. And if that's you, keep taking it. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank God for that. But if it's not working, I would argue that you have a spiritual problem. and not a, It's a spiritual problem issue and not a physical issue and the problem is many times especially Christians seek out help for something physically when it's something that needs to be dealt with spiritually so when you try to deal with the spiritual physically you have another problem now you have a physical problem most often and record staggering numbers 
of youth and teens and, and adults who are depressed, anxious, uh, despondent, suicidal thoughts, all these things, worried over the future, fear that grips them, that cripples them just like a paralytic. And this is what I call an invisible disease, an invisible sickness that takes an invisible miracle. I've been in the ministry a long time. I've seen a lot of people come to an altar just like this, just like we did right here, with pain in their body, and they would testify that God touched them in that moment and healed their body. And I would see that. Everybody would see it. You would witness a physical healing. I've seen people who have had cancers show up on an x-ray screen only to pray the prayer of faith and see that picture again after and the cancer's gone. You can physically see that God healed somebody. And aren't you glad that he does? But I want to tell you, mental illness can be just as debilitating as someone paralyzed. A palsy, a paralytic. But we see these staggering numbers. But I want us to see something here. Because in this passage, I've never seen it the way I've seen it before. And I got this message a few weeks ago. I've never preached it. I, this is, I was just reading through it, and the Spirit of God laid this on my heart. I want you to receive it today. Because maybe you're suffering in silence. Maybe you haven't told anybody how you're feeling. The thoughts that you've had, the, the despondency, the depression, fear, whatever. Maybe you haven't said anything. And I want to tell you that we are here today as a church family to lift up one another, build up one another, and to help one another. In Mark's gospel, we see corporate faith to see an invisible miracle. Let me read it again, starting at verse 2. Straightway, many were gathered together insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them, and they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, a paralytic, which was carried by four men. And when they could not come nigh unto him, they uncovered the roof where he was. When they had broken it up, they let down the bed where the sick of the palsy lay. Now notice what Jesus says to the man. First, he saw their faith. Did he not? Notice their faith. Not just the man with palsy, but the four men who were carrying him. He saw their faith, their persistence, their desire to get to the Lord Christ. But notice what he does. He obviously sees this man as paralyzed. He's lying on a bed, and he's conducting healing meetings here. But he doesn't say, rise up and walk. He says, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, I can imagine that man lying there and thinking, well, thank you, but I actually came for something else. But Jesus dealt with the spiritual aspect of the man's life before he dealt with the physical. And I want to tell you, that's what he desires today. He desires to deal with the spiritual aspect of your life. Will he heal you physically? Absolutely. But this morning, I want you to understand he's just as uh, interested, if not more interested, in your spirit man and your soulish man being well, because one day your body's going to give out. If you live and the Lord does not return, you will eventually take your last breath. But your spirit man will live forever. And that's why Jesus said, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not corrupt. And he said, set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth. But I'm, I'm glad that I believe God heals. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying this morning in this place, he wants to deal with your spiritual life, your mind. Look with me at Ephesians 4. Put your finger in Mark 2. Ephesians 4, and I want to read this passage to you. I'm assuming we don't have it on the screen. Is that right? Okay. Ephesians 4, and I want to look at verse 22. Ephesians 4, verse 22. Now, this is in the context. Yeah, very good. So I'm going to read it from the New Living Translation. And this is in the context of the body of Christ, the church family. All right? He says, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Now, he's talking to Christians here. 
And he's saying, look, the old man wants to rise up occasionally. You want to walk in the flesh, tell people how you feel, what you think, and, and you have to set that aside. You have to make a conscious decision to set that aside. How do you do it? Instead, let the Spirit shout Holy Ghost. Oh, hallelujah. Let the Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. That's where it starts, right there. How do you look at something? How do you approach something? Go back to that verse. How do you, uh, you know, it's not so much what's happening to you, but how are you reacting to it? How are you responding to it? Yes, you may feel these things. Yes, there may be some mental anguish and some things going on in your mind and in your soul. But how do you approach it? What is your attitude? Do you allow the Holy Spirit to renew your mind? That's what King James says. Let the Spirit renew you in your mind. Amen. Shout amen. amen. All right. Put on your new nature. Created to be like God. Truly righteous and holy. How do you do that? Stop telling lies. Amen. Now, this is the point I want to make here. Okay? I'm not so much talking about telling a story or I think in this context within the body of Christ, you and I need to be honest with one another. Amen. Don't hide how you're feeling. You may be suffering this morning in silence. Don't hide it. To hide it is to lie about it. But he says the way you do it, stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all part of the same body. Folks, we are a family here. If you're hurting, I'm hurting. If someone in this congregation is hurting, it should hurt you. Because we are part of one another. There are things in this church with people going through situations that absolutely break my heart, keep me awake at night. And it should be the same for you, not just for a pastor. It should be the same for you. Because if you're hurting, I'm hurting. If I'm hurting, you should be hurting. We are part of the same body, but we have to be truthful with one another. So when I stand here and I say, are you struggling in this area? with an invisible sickness that needs an invisible miracle, Amen. will you say yes and believe God to touch you? Yes. Go to Galatians 6. Take a left. Galatians 6, and they've got it up there. Thank you. Be careful not to fall. Well, that's, is there another part to that verse by chance? All right, Galatians 6, 1. I'm going to read it from the, the Bible, brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Those who are walking in the spirit, those who are strong in faith this morning, you should be the ones reaching out to those who are struggling today. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. How do we fulfill the law of Christ? Loving God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. Here's how you do it. By taking care of one another and being concerned about one another and what one another is dealing with. But let me say this also. We can't help you if we do not know. Don't just expect people to read the body language in your face. You have to, with your mouth, say, listen, here's what I'm dealing with. I'm telling you the truth. I'm being honest, and I need God to touch me. And when you do that, I believe that's when the Spirit of God, through His church, through His body, will perform an invisible miracle that will change your life. You may not be able to see it on an x-ray screen, and it may not be seen visibly to the congregation, but you'll know that the Lord has touched your soul and renewed your mind and given you peace that passes all understanding. Hallelujah. Go back to Mark, Mark's gospel, Mark 2. So we need corporate faith this morning to see an invisible miracle. Secondly, I want to talk about root hindrances to invisible miracles. What's hindering it? Notice verse 5, once again, thy sins be forgiven thee. Jesus wanted to deal with the spiritual aspect of this man's life. And there's a reason he did it. Because I believe in this text, he's showing us that he wants to heal us in our mind. 
just as much as he wants to heal our body. You believe that, raise your hand and shout amen. amen. And I believe he wants to do it today. Amen. I truly believe that. But he said, son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Let me say this, don't ask Jesus to help you in your physical circumstances until he deals with your spiritual life. Amen. There's sins of the flesh, and there's also sins of the spirit. Now, we've preached on the sins of the flesh for many years, right? Don't drink, smoke, and chew. Don't hang out with people that do. You know, fornication, adultery, you know. Yes, sins of the flesh. But how about the sins of the spirit? How about unforgiveness? How about bitterness? How about envy? How about jealousy? How about you being offended by someone and not making it right? A lot of times, there are hindrances to your mental and emotional well-being. In fact, James chapter 5, go with me there, and let's read together James chapter 5. And this is the passage we read quite often that we live out every Sunday when we pray for the sick, James 5. But I want you to see something perhaps you've never seen before in this passage, something that I witnessed. James chapter 5. And we'll start at verse 13. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. We just did that, didn't we? And they are to pray over him. I'll point your attention to the screen. That way we're reading the same translation. We will pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will restore the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, hold it right there. Why would James say that? Why would the Holy Spirit say that? Now, we can't automatically assume that every sickness or every mental illness has something to do with sin. Because it doesn't always, that's not always the case. You could be physically uh, something physically wrong with you. There could be something. You could be fighting spiritual warfare, serving God, but you're fighting a warfare. Or there could be sin in your life. And many times that is the root hindrance to your mental and emotional well-being. Hidden sins that you have not dealt with. And I'm being delicate about this. Because that's what I want to focus, because James himself, in the context of praying to be healed, not only physically, but mentally, emotionally, he says, if you've committed sins, they will be forgiven. And he goes on, let's go on. Verse 16, therefore confess your sins to one another. Stop. Now, this is important. Now, we take that passage and we say, find somebody to tell who, what you're struggling with. I, don't do that. What he's saying here is if you've got something against your brother or sister, you better confess it and make it right because that will hinder emotional healing in your life. And usually physical disease has something to do with inner turmoil. Not every time, but often it does. It breeds cancers. It breeds diseases. Because you hold the turmoil of those sins of unforgiveness and bitterness and offense in your heart and in your life, and you won't let it go. I'm telling you on the authority of God's Word today, let it go. Amen. It's not worth your health. It's not worth your mental well-being. And if you want to see an invisible miracle in your life, doctors haven't been able to help you. Medicine can't help you. But I'll tell you who can the one who looked at the sick of the palsy. And instead of saying, take up your bed, pal, he said, thy sins be forgiven thee. Why? Because he wanted to deal with the spiritual aspect of his life. Because when you deal with the spiritual, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another so that you may be healed. Glory to God. And then he goes on to say, the frequent, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. 
So we pray every Sunday morning for the sick. But if you're not abiding by these scriptural principles, it means nothing. You have to walk in obedience. Thirdly, I want us to look at an immediate response to an invisible miracle. Look at verse 6 of Mark 2. Verse, and I'm going to close this out. Mark chapter 2, verse 6. Mark chapter 2, verse 6. Don't you just love those cars that sound like a weed eater? <laughs> like that's cool, you know? Sounds like a two-stroke engine out there. Mark 2, verse 6. Look with me. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. And in verse 7, why does this man speak that way? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins except God alone? I like verse 8. Immediately, Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were thinking the way within themselves. Do you know he always knows what you're thinking? Isn't that amazing? I said to them, why are you thinking about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, pick up your pallet, and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on the earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralyzed man, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone, so that they were all amazed and were glorifying God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Yeah. Listen, my point here is that when you are healed emotionally and mentally, oftentimes that's going to bring healing in your physical body. What Jesus did for this man was heal him internally, forgave his sins, healed his emotional sickness and disease, that hidden invisible disease, and performed an invisible miracle. You see, the Pharisees didn't have anything to say about that. They didn't see anything happen. They were dealing with the spiritual aspect. He was calling himself God, and they says, only God can do that. And Jesus said, well, you know it. You've said it. I am he. I am the Lord. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then when he said that, he said, let me go ahead and show you this. Go ahead and take up your bed and walk. My point is this. When God touches you on the inside, it will play out on the outside. And you can prosper and be in health even as your soul. Oh, prospers. Hallelujah to God. If you believe it, shout yes. Oh, praise be to God. He said, take up your bed. Well, I declare to you this morning, take back your mind. The Bible says that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon thee. Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your, you guessed it, your mind. Philippians 4, 6, it says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving make your request known unto God, and the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your heart and you guessed it, mind through Christ Jesus. He didn't stop there. He said, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just and pure and lovely and of good report and are praiseworthy, think about these things. Why don't you take back your mind today, tell the devil to go back to hell where he belongs, and declare, I belong to God. He has not given me a spirit of fear, but a power of love. And a sound mind. Why don't you just say it? I have a sound mind. <laughs> I got to be honest. I'd much rather be touched in my mind. I got a knee problem right now. I've asked God to touch me and heal me. It's getting better. But if I had my brothers, I'd rather feel good right here. And right here. Because if I'm good here, I can handle all this other stuff. And it'll usually play out 
And I give God praise. Because when I ask God to heal me, I already know that he's done it. I may not see it today. I may not see it tomorrow. But I might see it next week. But if I don't see it next week, one of these days, oh, hallelujah, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. And I've got a promise that I'm going to get a new body, a new kneecap, a new heart, new lungs, a new everything. And prayerfully, a head full of hair. Praise God. Steve, pray that anointing on me right now, brother. When I met him, I said, pray that on me, will you? Gosh, some guys have all the luck, you know. Praise God. I told you about Michelle. I said, will you love me when I'm fat and bald? She said, sure I do. (laughs) All right. Jesus, when they... When they arrested him, they arrested him in a state that was, I don't think he had his shoulders square, chin high. He said, here I am, come get me. In fact, Luke's gospel tells us that in the garden he was sweating drops of blood. That's, that's stress. You think you're stressed. He was stressed. That's a real thing. That's a real, that's a thing. He was feeling the weight, the anxiety, the pressure of life. The fact that he was going to give his life and his humanity, he realized that he was going to be beaten and that he was going to die. They stripped him of his garments, placed a robe upon him, mocking him. They beat him. Isaiah said they pulled the beard out of his face, and you wouldn't even recognize him. But then there's a passage in the Gospels that said they took a crown of thorns, pressed it upon his head. I began to think the other day, you know, he shed his blood there for my mind. Glory to God. He took a crown of thorns so that I could have the helmet of salvation. He shed his blood from his brow so that we could have a sound mind and receive an invisible miracle. I just don't believe, ladies and gentlemen, that you have to live an anxious life all the time in constant fear and worry and fret as a child of God. I'm not saying it's not real. I know it's real. I know what you're feeling. But I also know that his word is above it all. And I don't have all the answers to it, but I do know this, that he shed his blood so that you could be made whole. Not only in your body, but in your soulish man, in your mind. You can be made whole today. Two more verses. I'm done. Psalm well, one more. Jeremiah 17. Let's look there. Maybe they have it. Let's pray. Oh, looky there. Blessed. Is it all right to shout in the middle of October on a Sunday morning? <laughs> Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord <laughs> and whose trust is the Lord. I can't tell you how many times that I've went to this passage dealing with my mind because I want to tell you, you know where the battle is? Somebody tell me. Between your ears, right? That's the battlefield. I can't tell you how many times I've looked at this passage and said, yes, I'm blessed because I'm putting my trust in the Lord, but he's my trust altogether. He's all I need. Remember the old song, He's All I Need? He's, oh, I wish we could sing that. I wish I could sing it. I would. Verse 8. For he will be like a tree. Now, here's what I like to do. I like to put my name there. 
For Gary, you put your name. For we will be like a tree planted by the water that extends its roots by a stream and does not fear when the heat comes, when a pandemic crosses the globe, <laughs> when the economy tanks, and it will. <sighs> but its leaves will, my leaves will be green, and I will not be anxious in a year of drought, nor will we cease to yield fruit. Amen. Why? Because we trust in the Lord, God, Jehovah. What are you dealing with today? What are you battling? Now, the first step is the step of being honest. Saying, you know what? I have some of these feelings. I feel this way sometimes. I want to tell you. He's worth everything, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, glory. I don't know why I'm so emotional. I guess I just believe what I'm preaching. I believe it today. And when, you're, when you preach, you know, pastors and preachers, they'll tell you. When you preach things, I believe the Lord requires you to live through it first. Or live through it during because I've never been attacked more since I got this message. But I'm declaring it today as boldly as I would if I wasn't. Come on, amen. Because Joe, I tell you, I trust his word. My God in heaven, I trust it. And the first step of faith is saying, you know what? I am struggling. And you know what? There's somebody I need to make things right with. And that's what it takes. Folks, be an encourager. That's something he's dealt with me, Doug. You know, I listen, I know I've stood here and preached some hard messages that were a little harsh. But it, sincerely, it was out of my love for you and this church. But I admit I've been harsh. But the Lord has helped me to understand that I am to be an encourager to you. So that's what I'm doing this morning. I want to encourage you. That if you're struggling and you need the touch of the Lord, well, it's here. It's here today. And I want to encourage you. If the root is sin, confess, and he'll forgive you. Just like that. There's no penance. There's no priest. <laughs> it's just simply, I confess to you, Lord. And he'll forgive you. Do you believe it? Shout amen. amen.